Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. I want to mention to you that the handout for this sermon can be found on the services page of our website, www.centerpoints.org, on our YouTube channel, and my Facebook page. Now, this is the 12th message in my series called The Christian's Courageous Faith. Today, the message is entitled Faith of Four Flawed Vessels. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, so we can read it together during the message. Now let's examine how God can use the lives of his people, no matter how little or how great their faith is. We'll begin by looking at four flawed vessels. And what more it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, and what more shall I say? Do I not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah? See, one of the things that I've learned in my years of writing sermons, teachings, and even dissertations, is that when faced with material to draw from, it can be very overwhelming. The temptation is to cover everything, but it's not possible due to constraints of time. And when I'm running out of time, it's best to summarize and to get to the main point sooner than later. Now, the writer of Hebrews must have known this because at this point in Hebrews chapter 11, he says, I do not have time to tell about and then he's talking about all the heroes that he was talking about. Now, knowing that he had plenty more material, he decided that already having made his point, he didn't need to belabor it. Because he didn't have time to write out the full story of all the great heroes of faith, he decided to mention only a few names and then go for the finish in verses 33 through 40. Now, in verse 32, he mentions four names from the period of the judges. And then he talks about David and Samuel, and then a group he simply calls the prophets, which is a conglomeration that includes everyone from Elijah to Malachi. Now, David and Samuel, I mean, that goes without saying. We can certainly understand because they, above their contemporaries, were men who walked by faith in the living God. But who are these others? How did he pick them out? He names four men from the period of the judges, which was a wild era in Israel's history when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, as it says in Judges 21, verse 25. Now, here's what we do know about the four men he summarizes in verse 32. Gideon defeated the Midianites. Barak defeated the Canaanites. Samson defeated the Philistines. And Jephthah defeated the Ammonites. Now, these four men are mentioned only here in the New Testament, not anywhere else in the New Testament, only in the Old Testament. But the fact should make us pay attention because we also need to know that each of these four men had significant character flaws. They weren't phonies by any means. These are real men, flesh and blood heroes, whom God considered honored in spite of their flaws. They're four flawed men of faith that God used as vessels of his will for his glory. Now their faith was like ours, mingled with fear, maybe soiled with some unbelief and doubt, and spotted with compromise, and troubled by human reasoning. They had true faith, even though it was imperfect, badly flawed, but faith nonetheless. And, and God knew all about their faults, but he honored their faith anyway. And they're an example to us as flawed people that what you know we too can be used by God even though we have issues. And all of us have issues in one way or another. But God can use all of us. But first, we need to see that Gideon was fearful. It says, and think about this, it says, I do not have time to tell about. One of the men mentioned there was Gideon. So let's travel back in time to about 3,000 years ago, a little over, to meet a man named Gideon. Judges 6.12 tells us that the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, this surprising word came in the midst of the Midianite oppression of Israel. The Midianites were a vast army from the east who invaded Israel riding on camels. They came each year during the harvest time, just as the Israelites were harvesting their crops. They would plunder the land, get on their camels, ride out again, and then stay away until the next year's harvest. Then they'd come back and do it all over again. So every year at harvest time, the Israelites were losing everything they had worked hard for because the Midianites kept invading. It's pretty sad. I mean, you, you know, they let them do all the work, then they come in and take it. 
Well, the people of God were reduced to living in caves because they were frightened of the mighty power of the Midianites. In response to this crisis, God sends that a- an angel to tell Gideon that God is going to use him to deliver God's people. Now, the angel of the Lord is very clear on that point because Gideon was afraid, though, he had a hard time believing what the angel was telling him. He wasn't sure that the Lord had the right man to lead Israel. Then Gideon started asking for God to give him a sign, some unmistakable proof that he really had called him to lead Israel. He just didn't believe him. He was having a hard time believing it. Well, we see in Judges 6, verses 36 through 40, that he put out a fleece, literally a fleece, and asked God to make the fleece wet and the ground dry. That's where this whole saying comes from when you put out a fleece. Well, when God did it, it wasn't enough. When God did exactly what he said he was going to do, he made the fleece wet, but the ground was dry. But it wasn't enough for Gideon. So he asked him to do it again, but in the reverse, making the ground wet and the fleece dry. We see that in Judges 6, 36 through 40. Only then did Gideon finally believe what the Lord had told him in the beginning. And it wasn't a sin to ask God for a fleece, you know, a sign, but it was a sign of his weak faith because he already knew what God wanted him to do. Now we see a man of weak faith whom God used greatly. We can see in Judges 7 that God had Gideon send 31,700 of his men home. Then he used Gideon and his 300 men that were left to spring a nighttime surprise on the unsuspecting Midianites. I mean, here these guys weren't, they weren't expecting anything. And see, what, what Gideon did was God had him use a classic military ruse to make them think his army was much larger than it was. They had to do something unusual because the enemy forces were thick as locusts, it says, in the valley as seen in Judges 7.12. And see, one of the things that God wanted to do is he wanted to show that it was him doing the victory, not these men that were with uh, Gideon. That's why he sent all those other ones home. So what Gideon did was he divided his 300 men into three groups, and he spread them out around the vast Midianite army. At the appointed hour, the men began to shout, blow trumpets, and wave torches in the darkness. Well, the Midianites fled in total confusion, leading to a complete defeat of the enemy and a total victory for Gideon and his men. Turns out that Gideon really did make a fine military leader once he got past his fear. As long as he thought he couldn't do it, he was right, he couldn't do it. But once faith replaced fear, he won a mighty victory for the Lord. So that's that's Gideon. So now we see Barak. He's the timid one. Uh, You know, the Bible, of course, says, I do not have time to tell about, and let's say Barak. Now, whenever you mention Barak's name, we must always add another name to it. It's not just Barak, it's Deborah and Barak. Well, who's Deborah? Well, it's not his wife. Deborah was was the only female judge of Israel. She judged Israel because none of the men would step up to do the job. After 20 years of humiliating oppression at the hands of the Canaanites, God raised up this prophetess to represent him to the people of Israel. Since Barak commanded the army, Deborah sent for him and told him to go into battle. She even gave him the battle plan. Judges 4, 6 through 7 says, She sent and summoned Barak, the son of uh, Abinanoam, and Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you at the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Well, on one hand, this is very simple. God gave the battle plan to Deborah, who gave it to Barak. All he has to do is rally the troops, go into battle, and win the victory. But check out his timid response in Judges 4.8. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. I mean, what? I mean, it was his job to face the enemy. He's the, the in charge of the army. He's the leader of the army, which means he has, have, he has to have courage in face of great danger. But Barak won't even go to battle unless Deborah goes with him. I was almost like, 
Come on, mommy, go with me. It, it, it's like, you know, he just can't do it without her. And I'm sorry, that's pretty sad. He won't go to battle unless this woman of God goes with him. Well, check out what Deborah says in response. In Judges 4, 9, she said, I will certainly go with you. However, the fame shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, for a, a mighty man of valor, that's kind of an insult. But she was saying, a woman's going to win, not you. So even Deborah, a great leader in her own right, didn't like his response. So she said a woman would get the glory instead of him. And, and I can kind of understand Barak's hesitation. I mean, we find out in a few later verses that the Canaanites had something the Israelites completely lacked. They had iron chariots. That meant the enemy had a huge advantage on the battlefield. For the Israelites to attack, most would think that it would be a suicide mission. It's kind of like sending a bunch of preschoolers with sticks to do battle with a brigade of tanks. So what happens? God sends a storm and floods the Kishon, Kishon Valley, trapping the iron chariots. They can't move. So it turned into a slaughter. It was a rout. It was a total victory for the men of Israel. And in an ironic twist, Sisera, the captain of the Canaanite army, he escaped only to be tricked, trapped, and nailed to the ground by a woman named Jael, who drove a tent peg through his temple. I mean, in Judges 4.22, we see Jael saying to Barak, Come, I'll show you the man whom you are seeking. So he entered with her, and behold, there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg in his temple, killed by a woman, not by a man. But so even though Barak led the troops into battle, Deborah and Jael, they get the credit. Was Barak a, a bad guy? No, he was, he was really a good guy. He was just too dependent on other people. But still, God honors his faith for going into the battle because he's listed in Hebrews 11.32 as a man of faith, but he was timid when he should have been a strong leader. So now let's look at Samson. Samson, he was out of control. I mean, it says, I do not have time to talk about Samson. Now, most of us know the general outlines of Samson's story. We know he was defeated by the Philistines, and we know that Delilah tricked him into revealing the secret of his strength. And that's really a, a, an issue because he needed to not tell her that. I mean, that was something that God had given him. And we, and we know about his eyes being gouged out and how he gained revenge by killing 3,000 Philistines in one of the most dramatic death scenes in the Bible. Now you think about this because when it, when it comes to this last period of time in his death, it says that he killed more in, that, in his death than he did the whole time he was alive. In one shot, he took down the house and all the people in it and on top of it. So, so there's so much more to Samson though. I mean, he had it all. He had good looks, he had great strength, he had popularity, and he had the blessings of God. And he threw it all away. He had unlimited potential. No man in the Bible started out with so much going for him, and no man ended with less. He had it all, and he let it all get away from him. See, Samson is a bristling bundle of contradictions. He was a man of faith with a weakness for women. He was a man of prayer given to uncontrollable fits of anger. He was a leader of Israel who had a desire for Philistine women. He was a man of God who sometimes lacked common sense, and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, yet he often lived in the flesh. Now, he's listed in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith, yet he slept with a harlot. When, he read, when we read Samson's story, his most basic problem was that he never learned how to control his emotions. First, he was filled with desire, and then he was filled with anger. Then he was full of desire again. Then he was angered again. Then he was filled with desire again. Then anger again. He keeps going back and forth. One moment he's worshiping God and the next he's flirting with Philistine women. On one occasion, he leads the army of Israel to a stunning military victory by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then later on, he sleeps with a Philistine prostitute. Now, not long after that, he meets Delilah who tricks him into revealing the secret of his power which leads to his imprisonment 
and of course later to his death. Samson never learned to control his emotions, so they controlled him. But he never really learned to control his temper or rule his spirit. He lacked good self-control. And Samson's up and down life teaches us that it's very possible to be empowered by the Spirit of God to do great things for him. And yet, not to have a life totally yielded to the full control of the Holy Spirit. He was flawed, really, just like us. He could sometimes do amazing things for God, just like us. And he could turn around and make mistakes, just like us. And yet he began to deliver his people from the Philistines, just as the angel of the Lord said he would in Judges 13, 5. And even with his flaws, and think of this, for everyone to see, he shows up in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Why? Because he was a man of faith. And God saw that his faith was so great that he included him in the list of heroes in Hebrews 11. And then next, we see Jephthah. Jephthah was foolish. You know, you think about this, as the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, he also says, I do not have time to tell about Jephthah. Now, the first verse of Judges 11 tells you that the essentials about Jephthah. Each one of us can read that and you can see about him. In Jephthah, he was a Gileadite, and he was a mighty warrior. His father was from Gilead, and his mother was a prostitute. Not a very promising beginning. Maybe that's part of the reason why he was such a great warrior, because I'm sure everyone knew about his past, and many people held it against him. You know, things like that drive a man to prove himself over and over again. When he grew up, his family turned against him, so he ran away and gathered a group of hoodlums to, to gather with him, and they joined in together as a gang. When the Ammonites attacked, the men of Israel asked Jephthah to come back home and lead them in battle because he was their best warrior. Here they treat him like dirt, and now when they're in trouble, they call on him saying, help. Well, after some negotiation, he accepted their offer. Then he began to negotiate with the Ammonites, reminding them that they really had no quarrel with the Israelites, but it didn't work. So the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him as he prepared to go into battle. At that moment, he made a foolish mistake that would haunt him forever, and it's the one fact that we remember about him today. In Judges 11, uh, Chapter 30, or verse 30 uh, through 33, it says, He vowed that if the Lord would help him win the battle, then he would offer to the Lord a burnt offering of the first thing that came through the doors of his house. When he returned home from fighting the Ammonites, now no doubt he expected the first thing to be an animal of sort. So he says when he returned home from the Am fighting the Ammonites, he would do this. So most likely he thought, you know, an animal will come out. But to his shock and dismay, it turned out to be his daughter, his only child, coming out to welcome him home. Distraught, he rips his clothes and says in, Gen in Judges 11.35, I made an oath to the Lord and cannot break it. For two months, he allowed his virgin daughter uh, to spend time in the hills with her friends. And then... Judges 11.39 says, After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her, her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. Now, there has been much debate about what Jephthah actually did with his daughter. See, human sacrifice, such as a burnt offering, was a heathen practice and was strictly forbidden by God and would not have been an acceptable offering by God. So although some scholars believe that Jephthah actually went through with the sacrificing uh, of, as a burnt offering, his daughter, most scholars believe he offered her to the Lord in a life of perpetual virginity. She would never have gotten married or birthed children or carried on the line. Either way, it was a rash and a foolish vow, and it came on the heels of a great victory over the Ammonites as seen in Judges 11, 32 through 33. But through the faith of a foolish, flawed vessel, God saw through Jephthah's weaknesses, and he shows up in Hebrews 11 as a hero of the faith. So, with these awesome stories from the Bible, what lessons have we really learned about the four flawed vessels? I think it's really important to understand, because Gideon, he was afraid to answer God's call. 
Barak, he was timid. He needed a woman of God to tell him what to do. Samson, he couldn't control his emotions. And Jephthah made a very foolish vow. And these are very seriously flawed men, yet they made the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, which many others have not shown up there. If there's room for them, let me tell you something. There's room for you and me. Down deep, they were men of faith who believed in God and were willing to act on what they believed. And their very significant faults can't be overlooked. But those faults didn't keep them out of the hall of fame in Hebrews 11. Why would God use men like this? God uses flawed people to demonstrate his grace so that when the victory is won, he alone gets the glory. We don't, he does. Paul said the same thing in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That's all we are, just clay pots, ordinary vessels that God can use when we have just a little bit of faith. And finally, I think it comes down to this. Either we believe in the redeeming grace of God or we don't. If we do, then we won't be surprised that God includes these four flawed heroes in the Hall of Fame. And we'll be glad that they made the book because that means God can use people just like us, just like us as well. So let's push on by faith, despite our failures, knowing that if God can use men like this, he can use us too. <laughs> Amen. I believe that. So think of that. If God can use men like this, he can use us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've given us examples in the word of God that can show that we too can be used by you. That if we just trust in you, if we just call upon your name, if we even admit our, our weaknesses and our failures, but even with that small grain of, of faith that you give us, that you can do mighty things through us because we believe. Lord, help us always to be the people that steps up and does what we're called to do. Regardless of what's, what our life has been like or what our past has been, whatever it may be, that we would be faithful to stand firm for you and do what we're called to do when it's time to do it. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and honor because you are a mighty and a holy and a worthy God. Thank you for these examples that we can live by and we give you all the praise and glory. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me for this message today. I really appreciate it. I hope you've learned something. I mean, to find more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website and in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. And if you'd like to find out more about uh, our Wednesday night Bible study and the Women's Thursday morning Bible study, just send me an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. Dot org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.